Hi and welcome, I'm Hammy and welcome to Headcanon. This used to be called Law Talk in this series. We're going to be talking about theories about Overwatch lore and story that come up from various new things that happen in the lore. Now of course with the Overwatch 2018 anniversary event there's over 50 new interactions detailing Lucio lore, Symmetra lore with Vishkar, Talon plans, Farah and her dad. What's going on with Widow? Is she feeling or not now? Can we be sure about that? Soldier 76, Moira, what Rez's plan may have been and his current condition and so much more. And so without further ado here are 12 core cool lore points and discussion topics that are my favourites from the new interactions, as well as your thoughts and quotes from your comments on my videos. So we'll discuss some of your theories as well. Time codes is always in the description below if you want to skip to a particular lore talking point. Righty ho, let's get started. Right, straight in at the beginning, lore learnings about Lucio and his sonic technology. Now in previous interactions, we were led to believe from Lucio and Symmetra that perhaps Lucio stole this technology. We have seen it in his bio as well, of course, on the Overwatch website. We didn't have loads of reasons as to why. Now in a previous Previous interaction with Symmetra, Lucio responded with this. Stole? <laughs> you need to go ask your bosses where it all came from, then we can talk. And now we have these conversations. Vishkar's using you, just like they used my father. Yeah, you just wait, you'll see. Your father was a Vishkar employee. He understood our company's vision. A shame he never educated you. And also this mercy line with Lucio. Lucio, I never realized your father was the one who invented Vishkar's sonic technology. The Cortec was his life's work, owned and patented by Vishkar, but it's mine now. So this has some interesting reflections on Symmetra, which we'll come on to in a second, but what of Lucio? We had previously had Lucio's story of a close-knit community thrown into chaos when Vishkar redeveloped large tracts of the city after we saw the events in Rio de Janeiro of Symmetra's comic A Better World. We know Lucio stole sonic technology from Vishkar that had been used apparently to suppress the people and converted it. Uh, we never really knew how he was able to do this and now this fills in some gaps. If Lucio's father was an engineer and created the core tech as he said in this line, then that would kind of explain how Lucio could take this stuff and adapt it when he's kind of a musician to start with. Maybe he's picked up a few sonic engineering tricks or engineering tricks of some kind or another from his dad. But the real question is now, how did Lucio's dad end up working directly for Vishkar? If the tech is owned and patented by Vishkar, did they somehow acquire it? And Symmetra obviously knows that Lucio's dad was working with Vishkar, a Vishkar employee in some capacity. So there's an interesting untold story there as to how Lucio's dad ended up working in that way, how Vishkar then did what they did in Rio, and how Lucio then stole this tech. So is Lucio kind of rebelling against his dad here? Uh, we don't really know the sort of father-son relationship and things like that, um, but that's certainly more depth to Lucio's story, depth to what's going on in Rio, depth to his little kind of uh, uprising that he caused there and who knows maybe it lays the ground for a Lucio comic or maybe a Lucio short or something. Lucio is one of a few heroes such as Diva, Zenyatta and Mercy who have not had long dedicated time to them in any kind of lore asset like animated short, comic, uh, blog, things like that within the last two years. So this gives some background to Lucio, it'd be nice to see if it tees something new up. Some of you guys have some interesting theories, I like this from 003D1 saying, you know, maybe his father started working on Vishkar's tech trying to help others but then somehow it kind of got acquired. As we know the president of Vishkar is part of Talon, I'm not entirely sure whether he's president, he's certainly high up if you're talking about Sanjay but we'll talk about him in a bit. Maybe Lucio's father disagreed, maybe they got in a fight, who knows. Uh, we don't know either way as I just said before. As 3D1 says here, maybe Lucio's father is actually evil, who knows, uh, but there's an interesting story to be told there. Well next up, these actually as well as some of the other Symmetra lines cast some interesting light onto what Symmetra's current position is. Now at the end of A Better World, her comic, we saw her sort of doubting whether they were making the world a better place when they kind of blew up the favela and caused the horrible burning of that young lady that Symmetra had met earlier in the comic. Now I think it's pretty clear from Symmetra's interaction with Doomfist, she says basically that he is the kind of the personification of chaos and she thinks that order is what's necessary to sort of restore and bring sort of balance to the world. Symmetra from that really has absolutely no idea as to what her handler, her boss Sanjay Korpal, is doing with Talon. So just to quickly refresh you, in A Better World, Sanjay is sort of Symmetra's handler, clearly a high up in the Vishkar Corporation that Symmetra works for somehow. And then we also see him kind of semi-silhouetted at the end of the Talon comic Masquerade, and then also directly in Moira's origin trailer at the Talon High Council table. 
along with Reaper, Moira, Doomfist and similar. So what is Symmetra going to do? How is she going to feel when she discovers that um, for example, Sanjay, the person who presumably she has a lot of trust in, her kind of senior within Vishkar, is working so closely with Talon, this force for chaos. Now, remember that Overwatch in-game voice interactions aren't direct canon, but they are reflecting on what might happen in canon law in a non-canon situation. So, Symmetra and Doomfist may have never had this conversation, but if Symmetra was to speak to Doomfist, it's fair to say that this is the kind of way she would feel about him and Talon's ideology and methods. So, what is Symmetra going to do as and when she finds out what's going on, maybe how deeply uh, Sanjay, how deeply Vishkar are involved with Talon or not. That's going to be very interesting to find out. I love this comment from Throne in the Ocean over on the YouTube on the interactions vid saying maybe they could use Symmetra's Law as a reason for the new upcoming rework. It's possible she could decide to reinvent herself after discovering the corrupt, chaotic truth of the Vishkar Corporation, creating brand new technology as a symbol of her newfound order. Well, remember, of course, Symmetra's going to be teleporting teams uh, to high ground and all around the place. She might have this shield that's going to be high and wide and cover pretty much the entire map so she is going to have some crazy stuff in her rework which by the way is due on the ptr sometime pretty soon uh, keep an eye out for me doing a video on that maybe it's time to get out my microwave account with the symmetra golden gun and for it to return to its origins uh, i did play a lot of symmetra on that account before making it a dps account but i digress i love this idea uh, remember of course that michael chio said before in an AMA over on Reddit that comics can take three months or so from start to finish, sometimes a bit longer from the idea through to the writing, putting together the art and putting it out. What I would say is that if they were gonna tie in Symmetra's lore or this change with a comic, uh, they'd had to have started this a fair amount of time ago. Um, it's kind of quite a big coordination piece. It's an amazing idea though, it is possible, and who knows, maybe it could happen in future. Uh, either way, all of this Symmetra stuff could lead to some more lore for her, maybe feature in an animated short or something like that. Final interesting thing on Symmetra was a little bit of anti-omnic kind of sentiment she had in her interaction with Zenyatta. She said this. <laughs> to be lectured about chaos and disorder from a machine. Now, a few of you have expressed surprise at Sim being a little anti-omnic, but remember that so many places had so much devastation caused to them around the world during the first Omnic crisis. Uh, India indeed was sort of particularly heavily affected as was Mexico. Vishkar arose as a company, as a corporation with their building technology and rebuilding after the crisis, including places such as their kind of headquarters at Utopia, a city apparently built of hard light that its architects, people like Symmetra, could change roads, change structures in the blink of an eye. It's one of my favorite candidates for a new level this year or beyond in Overwatch actually, so keep an eye out for Utopia. I think we could get that this year. Uh, maybe not a massive surprise, I think, then, that Sim is a little bit, let's say, anti-Omnic. I think quite a few people in the cast, or indeed, uh, generally people in the Overwatch world, might be a little bit mistrusting of Omnics, particularly at this point in time, after things happening like the King's Row Uprising seven years ago from the current day in the timeline or so. And generally, without Overwatch, this rise of anti-Omnic sentiment, the killing of Mondata, of course, by Talon. So there is definitely some controversy and some challenges with human Omnic relations in today's Overwatch world. I think Symmetra is just reflecting that. Uh, another shout out for Farah's dad, Sam. Uh, some of you, such as Genji Shimada, wait a second here, said, it's weird that Farah mentions her dad as Sam instead of dad in the interaction. That's kind of interesting. Uh, let's not forget that in Overwatch interactions, everyone calls each other by name just to make sure that the specific call out is there. I often think that it's kind of quite a clear sort of audio cue. So if I'm sitting there as Farah, and I'm talking to Anna in a pre-game interaction, Farah will go, oh, mum, or something like that, uh, just to overemphasize what's going on. Now, the reason I mention this is that some of you have said, well, Farah calls her dad Sam, therefore it sounds as though he's not her dad or he's her stepdad or, or, or something like that because of using the word, uh, the name Sam rather than dad. What I would say is that this kind of follows the Overwatch for voice line trend to me personally of this kind of overemphasis of points to make sure that the conversation is clear. We haven't had Sam name checked by anything else. Far could have said dad, that is true, and we've still got the point, but Sam was revealed by Michael Chu as being the name of Farah's dad in the Overwatch 2017 United Nations of Overwatch voice actors panel. So with this one, it's maybe a little bit too soon to draw too much into it by just him being named as Sam, but as with many things in Overwatch lore, I guess we'll find out in due course. At the moment, I think Sam's her dad, I wouldn't have any reason to think otherwise. It's interesting that Anna says, you let me worry about what your dad needs to know. So to me, Anna's calling him her father, so I guess he probably is. Don't know. Do you let me know your thoughts in the comments? That's just one people have been talking about anyway. 
Now, Soldier 76 and Moira, what is the deal between these two and what are they talking about with regards to Gabriel's plan here? You were a disgrace to Overwatch. If I had known what Reyes had been planning, I would never have allowed it. It seems to me that it was convenient for you not to look too closely into Gabriel's business. Now, we can take this at face value, and Moira does make a point that it was somewhat convenient for Morrison, as he was then, to turn a blind eye, this plausible deniability, um, making sure that he couldn't officially sanction um, Reyes's mission, for example, in the events of Retribution, to go into Rialto and try to deal with Antonio and the Talon threat, for example. But there could be other things it refers to. What was Gabriel planning? Was he actually planning the events of Retribution, or the way it was kind of presented, was it him making a decision on the spot? In frustration at Antonio's comments that he would just simply be released and free again. The other thing is, is Morrison in this interaction referring to something else that Reyes was planning? Maybe even something to do with Moira. I mean, Morrison in this interaction says, you're a disgrace, you're a disgrace to Overwatch. He is talking to Moira as much as he is talking about Reyes in this interaction, so he's clearly not happy with Moira's position. He must have known, I would imagine, that she was part of Blackwatch. Uh, but what were they planning? Was Reyes planning something with Moira? Was this some kind of bigger plan that we haven't seen yet? And if so, could it be tied to how Overwatch eventually fell. Even after the events of Retribution and the trouble it caused, the fact that Blackwatch was technically suspended. Let's not forget that McCree was still in London at the time of King's Row Uprising, when he probably wasn't meant to be, uh, due to the sort of semi-surprise of Morrison and Arna in the Uprising comic. This would answer one of the big questions potentially of Overwatch lore. I think there are three to me. There's what caused the first Dominic Crisis, how and why did Overwatch fall? And then the third one is how is any of this connected to the present day of Overwatch and the problems in the world and perhaps what this eye force is in the centre of Sombra's conspiracy web? What's causing the current day events to occur? Now since the cancellation of Overwatch's graphic novel, 100 pages of First Strike that would have been telling us about the First Omnic Crisis, we have been looking a little bit backwards in a bunch of Overwatch comics and events and similar recently, with the animated shorts focused on the present day and moving the story a little bit forwards as people answer Winston's recall. I'll have my thoughts on this at the end after all of these comments because I think we might be seeing a bit of a change in 2018, particularly with these interactions, but let's get on to some other interactions and things that we learn. Now, when Oasis was introduced as a map at the beginning of 2017, we did get a Reaper interaction with Sombra, which said that he was going to see an old friend in Oasis. We then learnt with Moira's release uh, later last year that she is indeed the Minister of Genetics in Oasis now. Uh, Oasis is run by four ministries with ministers of each section and a kind of council of very high-ranking scientists, of which Moira is one. So Reaper was presumably popping to go and see Moira uh, for reasons that we know not what, but we actually hear both in Retribution, which of course was eight years ago from Overwatch's present day, give or take a year or so, and also in this new interaction that Moira is still keeping an eye on Reyes's or Reaper's condition, as she calls it. Your condition seems relatively stable. No one's accused me of that in a long time. So it seems as though that Reaper is still being checked up upon by Moira every now and then. The real question though is if his condition seems relatively stable, uh, we've seen a Moira experimenting on him or maybe attempting to try and help him, of course, in the events of Moira's origin trailer. We still don't know if Moira caused this, if she's still kind of helping to support him through it. Maybe if it was something to do with the soldier enhancement program or things that were done to Gabriel Reyes way in his past that have perhaps only manifested recently. There's a little story to be told as to exactly why Moira was brought onto Blackwatch. It has been said in various panels that uh, Reyes was interested in her genetic expertise, but as to exactly why that was, uh, the two are clearly still in touch through Talon now, which is quite interesting. Are they friends? I don't know. But uh, certainly they, I think, had some respect for each other when they were working with Blackwatch. Uh, as a quick point with a couple of interactions, there's obviously the Moira May interaction where she talks about being interested in May's colleagues' research into the long-term effects of cryogenic freezing, the one sadly that makes May cry. And then, of course, Moira's interaction with Winston as well. Overwatch had good reason to shut down your research. I shouldn't be surprised at such a narrow opinion coming from a jumped-up ape. 
Now, as if we didn't know it already, it's kind of more character development or reinforcement for Moira. Now, in the conversation before that one with Winston, she sort of asks, was he never frustrated at the restrictions that Overwatch placed on his research? And Winston kind of said, well, of course, sometimes uh, a bit of caution is needed in a scientist. Now, Winston there actually is talking about something called the precautionary principle. Thanks to Zach Ogden in the comments for talking about that. Now, the precautionary principle is kind of defining how to act on issues that are considered to be uncertain, particularly in the scientific field, trying to justify decisions made where there's the possibility of harm from making a certain decision. So basically, there's a responsibility to protect the public or people from exposure to harm when scientific investigation has found some kind of risk from that. Now, as we have seen a lot more is interested in the end sometimes rather than the means. Maybe she wasn't interested in finding those further scientific proofs that provided sound evidence that her research, her work, wouldn't actually cause any harm. And it's interesting to see how she quickly flicks from sort of being very scientifically respectful. Obviously, in the case of May, she's just totally scientifically re respectful, calling her Dr. Zhao, amongst other things. She's very respectful to Winston in the first interaction, and then she just calls him a jumped-up ape as soon as he starts criticising her. So maybe touch a little bit of a nerve there, perhaps. As a quick little factual one, well, McCree's arm. Torbjorn doesn't know what happened to McCree's arm in an interaction between the two. And McCree said, oh, I always admired yours, figured I'd get one of my own, which is kind of an interesting one. Now that potentially dates McCree's arm. It doesn't look as though in the events of Kings Row Uprising that McCree has lost his arm in the comic. So given that between the events of Kings Row Uprising and the Swiss headquarters of Overwatch going up in flames was potentially a year or so tops, um, McCree, we know, left Overwatch and Blackwatch and kind of went underground. He was tired of infighting within the organisation as well. This dates a little bit more as to when McCree's arm might have gone missing sometime after the events of King's Row Uprising. And if Torbjorn didn't know about it, maybe after McCree left Overwatch and Blackwatch even, if Torbjorn was around to the very bitter end of Overwatch. So just a little nugget there. Okay, finally a chunky one before we get on to a couple of little ones. Now, Widowmaker's conditioning. Is it working or not? Is it wearing off or not? This is one that a lot of Widowmaker fans and law fans debate. We do, of course, have the Gerard line that Widow occasionally sighs when she spawns into a map as an intro. There's the Anna and Widow dialogue. Uh, Gerard was a fool to love someone like you, says Anna, and Widow says, you don't know anything about him. There's also the Moira line that was relatively recent. How are you feeling, Lacroix? Widow says, I don't feel. That's the point, isn't it? We then have this new Doomfist line on top. Watch my back out there, Lacroix. Tell me what needs to be done, and I will do it. So here in this interaction, we have Widowmaker just being, tell me what needs to be done, I'll get it done. Sort of very unthinking, unfeeling, the way that we have seen Widow described in her bio, the state that she was apparently turned into after Talon brainwashed her, got her to kill her husband, Gerard, etc. But we also still have that panel at the end of Reflections comic, which we see Widowmaker sort of standing and looking at Gerard's grave. We don't know whether she's thinking or feeling anything at that point, of course. It certainly looks a little bit reflective. So the question is here, is Widowmaker feeling a bit or isn't she? Is her conditioning working or isn't it? Is she telling people like Moira, is she telling or putting on a face to people like Doomfist that, you know, everything's fine and she's working business as usual? Whereas in actual fact, is the mask slipping a little bit? Is she thinking and feeling a bit more than she used to? We just don't know. But I just do wonder with some of these lines whether we're being shown kind of two different sides of Widow and whether we might get developments on that story soon. Do you think that Widow is still kind of this uh, emotionless assassin or do you think that perhaps there are some emotions starting to slip back into her personality and into her life? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments. It's an interesting one, that. Okay, last two things. Well, an interesting one between Genji and Tracer about rewinding time. What is it like to have the chance to change their past? Sometimes it doesn't want to change. So again, this begs the question, what is Tracer thinking about when she speaks so poignantly? Obviously, there are the events of a lie. She'd love to have saved Tikhata Mundata from his fate at the hands of Talon and Widowmaker and her widow's kiss, of course. But could there be other things, perhaps, that have happened in the last few years? Anything to do with the downfall of Overwatch? How has Tracer wanted to change time, but it hasn't wanted to change? itself. So yeah, just a, an interesting little one there. And last but not least, Sombra and Bastion. When Sombra says that Bastion would make, well, a good server, shall we say. Ah, you'd make a good barista, Bastion. Now, some of you might not remember this if you're new to Overwatch, but before Sombra released in 2016 BlizzCon, there was an ARG leading up 
to her announcement and launch. Part of it uh, involved website Sombra hacking into Lumerico, the company run by Guillermo Portero in Dorado, uh, the energy company in Mexico. Now, part of that, there was a website you could hack into. There were back and forth emails. Some of the employees were complaining that uh, an espresso machine had been broken. There were a few jokes uh, by that around the community at the time. And indeed, as part of that ARG, Bastion also uh, in Dorado, inside the power plant near certain Sombra protocol screens, would make a beeping noise that was then translated in terms of sound to be part of the ARG as well. Now you can see the old videos linked here before if you want to see all that. So Sombra, Bastion, coffee machines, Dorado, Bastion being a good barista. It's just a nice little reference to Overwatch's history uh, during this anniversary period. Now, I feel like I've only scratched the surface of a few things here. A shout out to a few of the other comments and theories. Ankylsaurus says, glad to see some of the characters are getting some personalities, especially have Doomfist of the world's worst salesman and cult leader. Yeah, Doomfist not really being very successful recruiting Hanzo. Compliments Symmetra uh, on her work as well. Doesn't really get any of those guys on board. Does seem like Talon are kind of recruiting for the next phase a little bit. Doomfist talking to all these people. Be interesting to see how that goes. A few thoughts from Pi. Yep, yeah, the villains do know what they're doing. Well, is Moira a villain? She's certainly not on the, perhaps the, the moral side here, but we all know that Moira sort of pursues her own moral agenda whenever it advances her cause most, uh, regardless of what side of the law or morality perhaps that falls on. Certainly, uh, Talon has got quite a good recruit in Moira, I'm sure. Pint Size Punker, I've had a sinking feeling that Moira was a Talon double agent for a while. Now, a lot of people have theorised on this, including an excellent blog by someone beginning with S whose name I can never pronounce. So, a lot of people have been thinking about a theory. Is Moira sort of somehow working for Talon during the events of Retribution? I'm going to go through that in more detail in another headcanon. I'll probably dedicate a shorter episode than this to that. And last but not least, one from Ardent Rain. Honestly, things are just getting started in the Overwatch universe. I can't wait to see where it goes and who's siding with who. I think this is a very good point to end on, actually. In terms of all of this. This is actually the biggest single dump, single addition of interactions, like 50 or so, since Overwatch actually launched. We've had little bits and bobs here and there. This is a huge lore update, a huge story update. It brings a lot of things like the Torbjorn and Bastion lines with Zenyatta and things up to date with the comics that we've seen over the last two years. So this anniversary, this is really bringing a lot of things up to date, bringing a lot of bits of story up to date uh, in terms of in-game interactions, matching stuff in the comics animated shorts, and it also sets up a few threads that we've talked about for the potential future of the story. So I think that now we've had this big update, we could see a big moving forward of the story. We've got two more heroes coming this year. One of them could be due in the next couple of months, indeed, or pretty soon. I think, personally, they're going to be more unlikely ones. There might be people we've never heard of, and I'm hoping that they're gonna be used to move the story chunkily forward. Things are happening, you know, things are going on, uh, as Genji said at the end of Dragons, and it's time to pick a side. The world is changing, brother. So, are we finally seeing that world change starting? Are we seeing some people trying to perhaps discover what's happening in the world and pick their sides? I'm looking forward to that. Really love to hear your thoughts in the comments as well. Thank you very much for tuning in. I know this is very long. I hope you enjoyed it. So much lore, so much interesting stuff to discuss in these more than 50 interactions. I had to take a bit of time over it. Uh, if you like this video, do throw a like, subscribe, and most importantly, comment with your thoughts, theories, and ponderances below. I would love to hear from them, and you might get featured in a new episode of Headcanon, indeed. Whether you like shorter bites of lore in my Lore Bites series, long explorations of the characters, maps, skin origins, and so much more comics animated shorts, please do check all of those out in the place on my channel and here, as well as just short voice line videos and all of the interactions that you know and love. Cheers for tuning in. I've been Hammy. Take it easy.